good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, everyone, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Akshat Amsali, and I'm an associate professor of chemical engineering at Monash University, and also the carbon team leader for the Woodside Monash Energy Partnership. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, uh, which is supported by the Monash Energy Institute. Uh, this webinar is on CO2 to products, uh, which is the third webinar in the series uh, of the Woodside Monash Energy Partnership. Uh, and we have uh, had two webinars before on decarbonization and hydrogen uh, energy. And this one is focusing on uh, CO2 to products. And I'll talk about the, the fourth one um, towards the end of the, the seminar today. But before we proceed, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land I'm hosting this webinar from. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which uh, you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of the Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land and waters of the Kulin nations. Today's webinar, as I said, uh, is on carbon reuse and transforming emissions or CO2 to products uh, for short. This webinar will focus on the hard to decarbonize industries, such as chemicals industry or the energy sector. Uh, and our panelists today um, will talk about converting the CO2 into value added products. What are the challenges uh, and opportunities that um, uh, face us uh, over the next uh, 10, 20 years? Most industries have got uh, a target of uh, net zero emissions by 2030. Uh, and um, obviously, many industries uh, are aligned with the government policies uh, on uh, net zero, um, certainly by 2050. So why CO2 to products? Uh, naturally, um, you know, CO2 is uh, thought of as, uh, as a liability, but uh, increasingly industries are seeing the opportunity that can be converted into products, which uh, adds revenue uh, to the industry and then can be offset, uh, can be used to offset the, the cost of CO2 capture. So before I uh, um, take too much of the time, uh, let me introduce our panelists today. Uh, so I'll go in the reverse uh, order. So uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Victoria Haritos, who's my colleague and collaborator at the Department of Chemical Engineering. Uh, she's an expert on uh, biological conversion pathways. Um, then we have uh, Dr. Jitin Joshi, who is the principal scientist at uh, Woodside Energy. Uh, and he's uh, really uh, an expert on systems level engineering. Uh, and both on uh, carbon conversion as well as uh, hydrogen production. And our first uh, speaker today is uh, Professor Jennifer Wilcox, who is a Presidential Distinguished Professor of Chemical Engineering and Energy Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also a Senior Fellow at the World Resource Institute. Her research uh, takes aim at the nexus of energy and environment uh, for developing an uh, uh, both mitigation and adaptation strategies to minimize the uh, negative climate impacts associated with the uh, fossil fuel uh, dependence. Um, so I'll hand over to Professor uh, Wilcox in a second, uh, but if you have questions during the, um, the, the talks, uh, feel free to write your questions in the Q&A section, please. Uh, do not use the chat session because uh, the chat might just disappear. Um, so uh, I hand over to Professor Wilcox, uh, please uh, welcome. So I'm gonna start off to talk about the hard to avoid emissions. So as Aksha mentioned earlier, there are, when we look at all of the global fossil fuel and industrial emissions that we have, roughly 34 gigatons of CO2 total, and you look at the hard to avoid emissions, um, they add up to roughly nine gigatons of CO2. This was reported by Steve uh, Davis in a paper in Science from 2018. And so when we break down what those hard to avoid emission sectors are, uh, typically what we're looking at are the industrial sector, like when we make iron, steel, refining, cement, but it's also associated with the transportation sector, like shipping, aviation, and long distance transport. Some of the work that we've done in my group, specifically focusing on car carbon capture retrofit to different industrial sectors. So this is an abatement curve that we generated uh, for a, a distribution of different industrial sectors, specifically in the United States. And what I wanna point out here aren't just the costs that we arrived at, these are nth of a kind costs. 
um, but they are also really based upon the concentration of CO2 that comes out of each of these exhaust streams. And so in some of these cases, like for instance, when you make bio bioethanol, uh, you generate CO2 at a pretty high purity. So the separation process is, is very easy and it's cheap. Uh, other sectors like hydrogen production, when you look at steam methane reforming, you can generate uh, pretty high purity streams of CO2 compared to say from the power sector. Uh, and then the other thing I wanna point out is that when you look at industrial emissions, specifically like things like cement, where you're calcining limestone at very high temperatures, in the furnace itself, you have process emissions that are generated from heating limestone, but that's mixed with fuel emissions in order to get the temperature of the, of the calcination process uh, high. And so what happens when you retrofit a cement plant with carbon capture, you actually reduce the emissions significantly at that plant. That's very different from, say, refining. So over half of the footprint associated with a refinery is associated with heat, not process emissions. And so carbon capture is not a blanket solution across all the industrial sectors. It won't work the same for each of the sectors. And it's important to recognize that carbon capture works well for some, but it's not the solution for all. And so carbon capture helps us to decrease that hard to avoid emissions wedge associated with the industrial sector, but it still leaves behind a lot of aspects that are difficult to avoid, uh, like heat. I like to show this plot. What this is showing is combined first and second laws of thermodynamics. Uh, and what this is really depicting is the energy requirement to do a separation, taking CO2 out of the gas mixture. So what you see on the right hand side is a higher concentration stream of CO2, say from making um, hydrogen from steam methane reforming. When we separate CO2 from that, it's called blue hydrogen. And again, the purity of the CO2 stream is higher than it would be, say, from steel production. So if you were to separate CO2, say, from a blast furnace exhaust, um, which is also higher in concentration than a power stream from natural gas um, combustion. And then as we go far to the left, you get an even more dilute system, and that's CO2 in the atmosphere. And CO2 in the atmosphere today is about 410 parts per million. It's very, very dilute. It's very difficult to separate CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, and so the point here is that you would never do direct air capture in place of simply just avoiding the carbon in the first place. And so um, what I'd also like to point out is that we're in a position where uh, avoiding carbon emissions is no longer enough. And so in addition to carbon capture and increased renewable penetration to displace fossil for the electricity sector, we're in a position to meet climate goals. We also need to be actively removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And so these methods uh, are not just one method, but they're many. Uh, and these are also termed negative emissions technologies. If you want to learn more about this, uh, there was a National Academy of Sciences study that was released in 2019, uh, last year. And we established a research agenda for each of these um, approaches to removing CO2 from the atmosphere. The one I'm going to talk briefly about is direct air capture. And so the idea here that I want to point out or make clear is that this is not a theoretical approach. We have technologies today uh, that we can do this with. Uh, there are two leading companies. One is called Carbon Engineering. They're based out of Squamish, British Columbia, uh, and they use a solvent-based approach to separate. And their, their approach is also um, benefits from economies of scale. So when they build a plant, the plant tends to be on the order of about a million tons of CO2 per year. And they have one of these plants um, expected to be built in the Permian Basin in Texas in 2023. One of the issues with their process is that they do require high temperature heat, 900 degrees C. And that's to be distinguished from another leading technology in this space, which is a company called Climeworks, which is based out of um, Switzerland. So they have roughly 15 plants globally across, uh, and each one of those plants, instead of being on the order of a million tons of CO2 removal, they're on the order of thousands of tons of CO2 removal, much smaller in scale. But the temperature required is about 100 degrees C heat, which means they can couple very well to waste heat in, in low carbon uh, energy resources like geothermal. Uh, the other piece I want to point out here is that although it takes a lot of energy to do direct air capture and much more than the more concentrated streams that I discussed, uh, the estimate is about 300 to 500 megawatts for every million tons of CO2 we remove. 
but it's important to not do the back of the envelope calculation, where if we want to remove a gigaton that you multiply that times 1,000, it's not quite that easy because roughly 80% of the energy that is used for direct air capture is thermal, not electric. And there's a lot of ways to think about making heat. And so you have to think about um, low carbon energy resources and how we might prioritize these for the different approaches. Uh, how can utilization be a bridge? So today when we think about what to do with all of this CO2, what are the utilization industries that might scale um, with the climate goals that we have? In the United States in particular, the largest utilization uh, opportunity is what's called enhanced oil recovery, where supercritical CO2 is used to enhance oil out of the earth. The size of the utilization is roughly 80 million tons and 72 million tons of that is EOR today, uh, with most of that CO2 mined naturally out of the earth. In fact, roughly about 60 million tons of CO2 in the United States every year is mined out of the earth in order to do this. And so to me, I look at that as an opportunity. It's a runway where we could actually look at a market of 60 million tons of CO2 in order to um, ultimately sequester the CO2 in the earth, which is what happens uh, in that process. Other industries are the construction industry. And so CO2 could be a feedstock also uh, for synthetic aggregate to be used uh, in concrete. And then the other aspect that I want to bring up is fuels. And so earlier when I talked about the hard to avoid emissions, uh, some of those emissions are associated with the aviation sector, shipping, and different transportation sectors, not to mention things like plastics and waxes and other, other um, chemicals that we use and depend on. Uh, so what I'm showing here basically is how crude oil is broken down today. When we have crude oil and we create all of these products from it, uh, what I'm showing in green are opportunities where we can actually make these same products synthetically by using CO2 and green hydrogen or blue hydrogen as chemical feedstocks. And so these technologies are commercially available today, either through Fischer tropes or methanol conversion uh, or other uh, biological processes as well either microalgae or bacteria are also opportunities to do this conversion. And so although these are not removals, so we are not necessarily taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and permanently removing it because through fuels you're re-emitting it, but we are doing is weaning ourselves off of our dependence on fossil fuels and essentially arriving towards a circular economy uh, through these opportunities. I'll end here um, by also showing this a little back of the envelope calculation and so if we think about concrete as a feedstock for building materials, which by the way, is on the order of tens of gigatons globally. So again, another interesting scale. And in this case, the CO2 can actually be sequestered into the product on a time scale that's of interest to climate. And so if we look at the ingredients of concrete, it's cement plus water plus aggregate, which can also be thought of as mine, sand and gravel. And so the cement is the piece that has the largest carbon footprint. What I'm showing in this, bar graph on the far left is a typical carbon footprint kilograms of CO2 per ton of concrete associated with the cement aspect. And so you see that if you were to do carbon capture on the cement plant itself, you get a reduction in terms of the carbon intensity of that ton of concrete, but it's only a reduction. But suppose that you did that in addition to storing the CO2 in a synthetic aggregate, in, in other words, replacing the sand and gravel with a CO2 sequestered mineral. Um, when you do that, you can actually arrive at net removal of that product. And the company today that's doing this is called Blue Planet, where they can store 100 kilograms of CO2 in a synthetic aggregate that would come out to be about a ton of concrete. And so again, these are not theoretical um, approaches. These are approaches that exist today. And these are companies that are actually moving this forward. They just don't tend to work together in order to have the significant impact that they could. Uh, and so what you see is concrete having typically a footprint of about 116 kilograms of CO2 being reduced all the way to a negative footprint of 131 when you combine all of the approaches. And so with that, I'll, I'll move on to the, I'll let the next speaker go. I'm happy to answer questions as we go through. Thank you, Professor Wilcox. That was an uh, excellent uh, um, introduction to the, the challenges and the opportunities of CO2 conversion. Um, our, our next speaker today is going to, uh, to advance that uh, agenda a bit. Uh, 
and talk about uh, the systems levels approach required to do the, the CO2 conversion. Uh, so with that, I welcome uh, Dr. Joshi, uh, who is the principal scientist uh, at Woodside Energy. And um, his, uh, his area of expertise is essentially uh, the systems level engineering to allow um, Woodside Energy and, and um, to, to implement the innovative ways for combining biological and thermochemical pathways have a diverse range of options for us to um, to valorize CO2 and have commercial potential for CO2 utilization and hydrogen production. Um, so with that, I welcome uh, Dr. Joshi to, um, to make his presentation. Thank you, Akshat, and uh, thank you, Dr. Wilcox, uh, for that uh, uh, setting of the, my, my talking points here. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to focus on uh, something different, i.e. what are some of the challenges in implementing is now a widely accepted theoretical construct on uh, converting CO2 into products. Uh, these things are possible. Uh, these things can be done. However, uh, there has to be an orderly transition from what we view as uh, traditional energy sources, which is oil and gas, uh, into, into CO2 conversion into products. Uh, <clears throat> we have to view this as a transitional state. Natural gas industry serves that baton uh, from which we go into use of non-renewable energy into transitioning into uh, renewable sources. <laughs> Uh, why has this not happened yet? Intuitively, what we talk about uh, converting CO2 into products uh, makes sense. But there are some realities that we have to address. Some of the biggest challenges that uh, we need to address from an uh, industrial scale are efficient capture and, uh, of CO2 from non-point sources. We have the advantage of uh, having some point source solutions, i.e. CO2 at very high um, uh, concentrations can be captured there. Some of the things that have to be worked is process scalability, which has not uh, happened in a large sector. Uh, and to be realistic, there is an economic uh, uh, advantage or disadvantage of converting CO2 into products in lieu of not using uh, non-renewables, which is competing with uh, oil prices. Um, also, some of the biological stuff that Victoria is going to talk about, um, you know, converting CO2 into food or other products, the product acceptance uh, um, from the public perspective is one of the other things. As Jennifer pointed out, many of the CO2 sorption and desorption technologies are high energy intensive. How do we get to a point where we have renewables being part of the architecture into CO2 productization? Or else, if we use the traditional sources of energy, electricity from natural gas, electricity from non-renewables, you are going to get CO2 credits, six on one hand and half a dozen on the other hand, you're going to create more CO2. So, <clears throat> pardon me. So actually creating a systems architecture by means of which where you incorporate deliberately from the get-go renewable energy sources and then CO2 uh, conversion into products is something that has to be thought through very uh, from the starting point. Uh, as an afterthought, it will become a non-viable non option in terms of CO2 sequestration. We are talking of 35 gigatons of CO2. We are also talking of reducing uh, CO2 emissions so that we get to a two degrees Celsius uh, temperature below what we are today. I can assure you that the current COVID crisis and also the drop in natural prices have actually been a good wake-up call uh, for 
the entire planet in terms of deliberately thinking through these problems. Uh, and, and I think most of the energy industry right now is actually making efforts in order to buy into the Paris Accord thing. It's not just a fashion statement for lack of a better word, uh, but we are having strategies, we are having uh, tactical plans in terms of getting to CO2 levels below. Uh, as my own uh, organization, Woodside Energy, we are in, in total consonance with the Paris Accord in not just meeting the goals, but in sometimes having a, strategic plans to exceed those goals in a timely manner. Um, so I will hand it over to Akshat and Victoria. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Joshi. That was, uh, again, um, a really good insight into what is required for um, achieving net zero emissions uh, or you know, without creating more CO2, so in, in integrating with renewables uh, for CO2 conversion and, and having really the, the high level systems level approach to thinking of this problem. Um, so that leads us, uh, that's a nice segue for us uh, to, to talk about some of the conversion pathways. And, and one of the leading um, pathways is, is biological conversion. Uh, and to, to talk about that, we've got uh, uh, Associate Professor Victoria Haritos, uh, who is um, uh, an expert in um, sort of the discovery and designing of enzymes uh, for specific and fast reactions in uh, biocatalysis. Uh, she's researching on the metabolic engineering and systems biology of cells and cultures um, to understand the underlying reasons of their heterogeneity and also uh, how to modify uh, these organisms uh, to have a high throughput um, and you know fast conversion uh, of the the feedstock into valuable chemicals. Um, so with that, uh, please welcome uh, Professor Editos. Thank you very much, Akta, and um, welcome to everybody on the webinar today. And thank you for that introduction and opportunity to contribute to the panel today on this really important and interesting topic. Um, it's my pleasure to be able to describe selected biological pathways for utilising CO2 as a feedstock and generating useful products from it. I'm going to share some slides with you. Uh, okay. Okay. So before we start, just a few words about biological CO2 utilisation and why it makes sense. Okay, so... Um, autotrophic fixation, so autotrophic meaning using carbon dioxide as a sole source of carbon for the organism. Um, it's a really, you know, it's a huge, major carbon sink on the planet. So if you think about all the plants and the bacteria that fix CO2, either phototrophically, so using light or using um, biological processes, this is a major sink for carbon already. So biological CO2 um, you know, utilisation already occurs. And um, a really big feature of this is that the CO2 source doesn't have to be pure, okay? So clearly the organisms that live around now have CO2 in the presence of a whole lot of other um, gases and molecules in the air. Then some other features of generally of biological production include that they, um, they can synthesize complex molecules. So that's a really nice, um, you know, you can end up with a nice complex molecule out of the end of the, the production process. Um, not only the biological macromolecules that the, the organisms naturally produce. Uh, microorganisms offer flexibility. So you can have the one microorganism that can produce many products at different times. So you don't have to change your entire setup to produce a new product, for example. Uh, Biological procedures usually occur in mild conditions of temperature and pressure, so you don't need special kit from that point of view. They, as I'm going to show you, many of them are scalable and they can be fully sustainable. So you know, we have good reasons to think about biological uh, approaches to utilise CO2 to make products. So if we let's think about a few um, ones that you may be most aware of. Okay, so um, I mentioned plants before uh, and one of the great fixes of CO2 in the atmosphere are microalgae. Okay, and this would be something that you probably would have heard of 
Okay, they grow in water, they use light and carbon dioxide as their sole carbon source, plus some other nutrients. They can be, depending on the strain you use, you could get one with high lipid content. And we heard from Jennifer, the value of lipids. You can use them for making biodiesel or synthetic fuels or industrial chemicals, or you might have other valuable products in a strain. Depending on, on you know, which report you read, you can have a higher potential yield from uh, microalgae than you can from, say, oilseed plants um, grown under the same acreage. The idea being that you um, have the CO2 gets fixed in the microalgae, it produces lipid, that lipid gets turned into biodiesel, it's burnt in an internal combustion engine, producing CO2, and you've got a, a cycle there. So, this was certainly the premise of that and the basis for a huge amount of work that was conducted on, on really trying to scale up microalgal production in the early 2010s. So uh, as I indicate on the slide here on the right hand side, you'll see some large scale um, attempts at um, getting microalgal production up to very large scales that would try and meet transport fuel needs. So there's an enormous amount of activity that occurred, in, as I mentioned, in the early 2010s. It sort of died off from about 2014 onwards. Um, and in fact, it really hasn't gone anywhere since. If you contrast that with um, algal production, microalgal production of beta-carotene, beta which is a food colouring, we see that this, um, this production actually preceded the fuels microalgal, and it's still continuing now. And Australia is actually one of the world's largest producers of natural beta carotene, just from two locations, one in South Australia and one in Western Australia. So depending on the product you've got, um, you can get microalgae to work for you. And uh, they're fixing CO2 meanwhile, and making a product that, um, that keeps, uh, is, has value and um, is enough to continue. Well, in, in fact, the value of it's high enough that it can cover the cost of culturing and, um, and harvesting the algae, which is one of the really huge um, economic uh, hurdles that you face with something like microalgae. If we, moving on, meanwhile, while there was a lot of noise going on about microalgae and its potential to, to replace um, transport fuel needs, there was a quiet revolution happening in industrial gas fermentation. Um, Jennifer mentioned steel mills earlier and the fact that they produce waste gases of which CO2 is a component. They also, it also has a large component of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So depending on, the, on exactly which industrial gas, well, waste gas this is, uh, there will be a mixture of gases of which CO2 is a component. A company called Lanzatech, which originated in New Zealand and is now a global company, um, saw the opportunity of using an, uh, what we call an anaerobic bacterium. This one in particular is called Clostridium. Anaerobic means it grows in the absence of oxygen. In fact, oxygen is toxic to it. It grows entirely on this mixed gas of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and hydrogen with some other nutrients supplied. And it efficiently converts this waste gas into ethanol and a product called 2,3-butendiol, which is a chemical intermediate solvent. Okay, so it has value of its own as well. So these organisms, these clostridia, um, have been demonstrated now that over the 15 years of life of Lanzatech. They've gone from lab scale right up to fully commercial scale. Half a million litre vessels uh, they're, they're doing their fermentation in. And this efficient production of ethanol and 2,3-butendiol has been demonstrated over five different industrial sites and over 40,000 hours of operation. So this is now demonstrating that you can have a bacterial organism that can cope with a mixed gas source and turn it into a valuable product. However, this, this um, process is heavily dependent on the carbon monoxide part of the gas mixture to make the process work. And we've been exploring in the research hub that um, we've recently um, initiated is to think about how, if we want to really turn this into a much purer CO2 source, how would this same organism, this same clostridium, how will it go in being able to use more CO2 in a mix, perhaps with some hydrogen? So some preliminary work has already been done in this area, and roughly half of the carbon from the CO2 gets converted into ethanol to date, but this can be improved. 
So what we can see here is using the same organism, perhaps with some genetic engineering to improve its productivity, to again make this into a very efficient ethanol or 2 3 butyl producer and scale it up and use it in as per the Lanzatec process. So we already see by establishing this large scale industrial gas fermentation setup that Lanzatec has done, for example, has shown the way forward for industrial gas use and getting, given the right kind of pathways and the right conversions, um, we can implement that. Now you might say not all gas sources um, have that mixture of carbon dioxide and hydrogen or, or carbon um, monoxide, and that's indeed they don't. In fact, many of the waste gas sources also contain oxygen. Up till now, we've been talking about organisms that can't tolerate oxygen. So if they've got oxygen in your mix, we need to think more broadly. And indeed, uh, we are already thinking ahead on this, and waste gases that contain mixtures of carbon dioxide along with, say, hydrogen, some, maybe some carbon monoxide, maybe hydrogen sulfide, and some methane, and, and oxygen. These are not uncommon, and these cause enormous problems when you think about having to clean them up to get CO2 out of them. Not only energy costs, but these can be very difficult to separate or poisonous to, to some processes. So in this case, aerobic bacteria, such as methyl acidophilium, is um, a perfect choice, okay? Large-scale proce large processing using this organism has not been done as yet, but we can see an opportunity here to follow the similar pathways I've been talking about in the last couple of slides, um, establish these organisms to be effective converters of these mixed waste gases into products. We can start quite simply at the beginning in having them produce protein. Okay, they'll produce protein very, very easily, very readily. This protein can be used as aquafeed or in pet food, for example. Ultimately, down the line, you can do some genetic engineering on these organisms to produce high value products. And again, we know how to do this industrial fermentation now at large scale. And we implement these processes and we can see how this um, could be tackled. So these complex gas mixtures be tackled. I want to finish off by talking about some new de developments that are going to make, uh, I'm talking about a step change difference in the way we deal and look at CO2. So two giants of the biotechnology world, the yeast Pitya pastoris and the bacterium Escherichia coli, two very well known, very well understood, large scale biotechnology organisms have been engineered to grow completely on CO2. So they're now autotrophic for CO2. This is a landmark thing. This has only happened in the last couple of years. Now we have an organism that we use in biotechnology every day at scale that can grow entirely on CO2. Yes, it, the productivity of that does need to be improved. And there are strategies that we are already thinking about of how to do that. For example, combining it with bioelectrosynthesis. So bringing electrons in from renewable energy, just as Joshua was talking about or hydrogen, blue or green hydrogen, and bringing that in to increase the productivity of the carbon dioxide as a sole feedstock. Also, we're working on engineered product pathways in these organisms. And when we're talking about products, we're talking about products like butanol, which we're already making in E. coli, and 1,4-butanediol. 1,4-butanediol is a polymer ingredient, which is used to make um, all kinds of, a whole wide range of polymers that are used in materials and you know, um, synthetic materials everywhere. Having a bio component to that is very important. And also valuable lipids. Okay, so these are some of the products that we are already making in these organisms. And we're now gonna combine that with the carbon dioxide utilization pathways. We already know how to use these organisms at scale. So just to summarise some of the points I've been making here today, I think the future is really bright for CO2 utilisation using biology. That we've got a range of traditional and cutting edge approaches to fixing carbon dioxide now into valuable products. Um, but we really need to focus on scalability and product economics. These are two key factors for success, as the microalgal example showed from earlier on. <laughs>
And now I'm going to hand back over to Akshat and we're going to go into our panel session, I believe. And thanks for that uh, um, wonderful techn uh, technical uh, presentation, uh, Victoria. I mean, um, th this really shows that, you know, um, biological pathways can and will deliver uh, at commercial scale as, as Lancet Tech is already showing. Um, but there's obviously lots more that we can do. Um, so if I can just kick off uh, the Q&A, um, maybe just starting with you, Victoria, about uh, what are the challenges you think in terms of, uh, you know, CO2 concentration. So we have point sources of CO2 from um, uh, various industries. Some may have impurities. Uh, so what sort of concentration levels of CO2 would be like the right range for, for growing these organisms and what sort of impurities you think um, that needs to be removed uh, for these organisms? Yeah, thanks, Aksha. Um, I think in terms of impurities, you need to think of them as whether these are valuable to the organism or are they detrimental or indeed are they filling up a lot of space. So nitrogen would be an example of the last one. So if you think about flue gas, flue gas um, for example, coal-fired power station flue gas, has a large concentration of um, nitrogen in there. That provides volume that needs to be distributed along with the valuable gases, CO2 or H2S or whatever they are through, through a fermentation. So whilst they're not toxic, whilst they don't cause a problem, they, you're talking about large volumes that you need to deal with that are not really valuable to the organism. So, so that's, that's to that side. Mm. Sulfur, uh, hydrogen sulfide, a very, very problematic gas for many processes. For many of the organisms I talked about there is not a problem um, until it reaches a certain high level. Okay, so it, it, it will become toxic at a particular high level, but um, in the sorts of ranges that occur in a lot of the waste gases, there's no real need to clean those up. As I mentioned before, some of the organisms that you might choose, like the clostridium, can't handle oxygen. So if you've got oxygen in that mix, you either you really do need to think about another organism because I think the separation of oxygen out of that may be, may be uneconomic. Yeah, so is there a minimum amount? Well, you know, the microalgae survive beautifully, grow quite well on, um, on you know, the, the atmospheric concentrations. They do do better if they're supplemented with carbon dioxide. But you can say, on the other hand, microalgae grow in very dilute, concentrations, we want to focus on organisms that can, can achieve very, very high densities in, in the solution. So we need to go up higher. We need to have point sources, well, sorry, we need to have feedstock sources that are a lot higher than atmospheric. And uh, we can go right up to 100%. Um, when you work with a, with a bioreactor or large airlift fermenter, it, you can circulate the gases at your, you know, as required for need. So it, they can't be, they don't need to be too concentrated. They can't be too concentrated. You can, you can adjust your flow rates, um, but they can be too weak. Yeah, so it's horses for courses. It really will depend on your organism and how fast it's growing and how fast it needs to utilize that CO2. Thanks, Victoria. Um, I might take some um, uh, questions uh, from our audience today. Um, up front, we have a question uh, about uh, what market devices or incentives uh, are needed for Australia. So maybe this question uh, for uh, Dr. Joshi, but also probably for, from Professor Wilcox, if she can uh, bring in uh, the, the world perspective or maybe the US perspective on what carbon credits or, or incentives are needed to make uh, CO2 to products are really viable in the market. So maybe Dr. Joshi first. So in terms of what incentives, uh, I think, uh, in order to boost this industry, and we have we started with aviation industry uh, in the U.S., the postal service became the paying customer to boost the aviation industry. I think some incentivization is required, which is going to be deliberate in terms of credits uh, that can be assigned to companies who convert CO2 to products. Aviation industry, if it is using jet fuel derived from CO2, uh, those kind of incentives will go a long way in cementing, no pun intended, Jennifer, uh, in cementing uh, CO2 as a deliberate strategy, productization. So we'll get there to get to a price competitiveness. 
with uh, oil and gas you need to have this in uh, incentives uh, there were incentives for oil and gas industry around the world when it when it became a large scale stuff so what is our end goal is is to be thought through not incentivizing uh, industry to convert co2 into products uh, will not help us achieve uh, the end goal of 2 degrees celsius and the, meeting all the intent of the paris accord yeah, professor wilcox Sure, I can talk about some of the policies in the US. Uh, so there is the federal tax credit 45Q. Uh, what that is, is that you can get up to $35 per ton of CO2 for utilization. Uh, and then it's up to $50 per ton if you're to actually have dedicated storage, geologic storage of the CO2. Uh, the qualifying limits are for, 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 for instance, if it's saying the CO2 is from an industrial stream, it's on the order of about 100,000 tons of CO2. So they're not necessarily matched with what all the streams look like. So there's efforts now to modify 45Q so that more streams could actually qualify. And even in terms of um, power sector, the qualifying streams are 500,000 tons per unit. Uh, some of the natural gas fired power plants actually don't emit that much CO2, so they miss that qualifying limit. So it's important. In, our, in my view, it was written a lot for carbon capture on coal uh, in the United States, but we're not really building new coal plants. And so I think it's important when thinking about new frameworks, new policies, that the qualifying limits uh, are accurately capturing uh, the technology that could benefit from carbon capture retrofit. And then number two, to make sure that the economics are actually matching as well. So although direct air capture qualifies for 45Q, these dollar amounts are much too low, considering that today's technologies for direct air capture are roughly $250 to $600 per ton. So $50 or $35 is not really going to do it. Uh, there's also the low carbon fuel standard, which is specifically for the state of California. Uh, the state of California made a pledge to be carbon neutral by 2045. Uh, and so if, if you're making a biofuel or you're making a reduced carbon fuel under a certain uh, carbon intensity and you're trading into the fuel market of California, you can actually receive that credit. It's between $180 to $200 per ton of CO2. It's very significant. It also direct air capture anywhere qualifies because the way that California sees direct air capture is it's offsetting their transportation sector through carbon removal. But today, the CO2 has to be injected into the subsurface. And I would argue that mineralization should count too, and it doesn't yet. And so again, there's a lot of work still to be tweaked with the policies, but I think it's a, it's a good starting place. Uh, thank you for those uh, uh, responses. Um, I might jump on to uh, uh, Another question, uh, how, how important do you think uh, carbon capture is versus utilization? Uh, and will the utilization be increasingly an important part of circular economy? And can storage be completely avoided? Maybe, uh, Jen, Jen uh, probably if we can go first. Sure, happy to. Uh, well, I would say, no, we can't simply avoid dedicated storage of CO2. Um, if we look at the utilization industry, if we look at the scale of products and chemicals that we use that could actually effectively store the CO2 on an interesting time scale, they're about one to five to maybe 10% of our emissions. And so it's just not a large enough scale. You know, and if you were to convert it to say fuels, then we all know that we re-emit that CO2 back into the atmosphere. And the issue is, is that there are these hard, we, we have invested infrastructure that emits carbon and that's probably going to continue to emit carbon through mid-century. So we have committed emissions associated with the infrastructure that we've already generated based upon fossil fuels today. And then we also have the legacy emissions that are accumulated in the atmosphere that we also need to remove. So and then finally we have the very difficult to avoid emissions like agriculture and the industries that we've talked about. Uh, so, so to simply say that we can take CO2 and turn it into a product that we use, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do that because it means we're lessening our dependence on fossil fuels and we're not adding to the accumulated pool in the atmosphere, but it's certainly not going to be a replacement for carbon capture or simply avoiding the carbon emissions to begin with. 
Uh, if, if I, I may add to that, uh, if I may add to that, I think Jennifer nicely answered the question in terms of blending reality with an aspirational goal. Uh, there is no, there is no one solution to this problem. It is a multi-pronged problem. You have to embed some levels of systems thinking in terms of all CO2 cannot be sequestered. All CO2 cannot be converted into products. And we have to have a transition path in terms of getting towards all CO2 getting converted to products, but not overlook the reality that it is not possible to just convert 35 gigatons of CO2 per year into products. Uh, there has to be, we want to get away from sequestration, but sequestration in itself is not a non-optimal solution set right now. If I could just add to that too, um, I guess, the issue of transport, you're right, the um, transport sector is the only one that really has the, the volume that can address a lot of the CO2 emissions. But, um, and, but, you know, yes, of course, if you're making the fuels from CO2 and then releasing it again, you're, you know, you're just contributing the CO2 back to the air, but you are displacing CO2 that might be used by, by a um, fossil source. So, so in, if in, it's in that case, then you, you are at least chipping away at something that is a really very, very large volume. It producer, also one that's a diffuse source of emissions that's very hard to capture. So. Excellent, thank you. Um, if I can um, go, move on to the next question then. Um, this question is from um, Wilson Heiko. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, they can uh, unmute themselves um, to ask the question. Yeah, there we have yeah hi hello yeah i'm just uh, curious uh, you guys have approached you have mentioned uh, biological approaches and thermochemical approaches i was wondering if you can address uh, the economics and also the, the technical benefit to one versus the other and do you see one as a winner going forward so i would i would say no, no one approach is a loser as opposed to one being a winner uh, when you want to approve, when you want to create commodity chemicals which are large scale just like methanol i think a thermochemical pathway makes sense because the time uh, required to manufacture that project when you are looking at commoditized having a balance of plant that is a constant and creating a variety of chemicals uh, depending on the market demand i think biological pathways make sense because you just change the organism the balance of plant remains the same. But it is not one solution from a techno-economic perspective. It is a blend of both. Uh, Victoria, if you, uh, from biological perspective. Yeah. yeah, and I think if we keep in mind the source of the CO2 as well, if it's um, you know, a very, very pure source that's very, very amenable very quickly and you have a renewable energy source to be able to make, for example, methanol, then thermochemical makes a lot of sense. If it's a mixed gas source, it's going to cost you a lot of money to clean it up, um, or indeed it will never be get to the scale that's more to the purity required for a chem thermochemical uh, chemical conversion. I think a biological one is uh, is very much open to to looking at, and as we've demonstrated through the Lancetec um, example, you know, a waste gas that was really in fact, not being used at all has been turned into a product that they've um, not only um, been able to use and go on and do something with it, it's actually turned them a profit. So, so it certainly can be successful if you can find the right combination at the right time, right, and the good productivity. So. Thank you. Um, our next question is uh, from Surain uh, Turia. Sorry, I probably butchered this surname, so I might not attempt it. Um, Suren, if we can have uh, him uh, online, please. If you would like to ask a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, Jennifer has answered the question. So, so my question is about scale. Really, you know, can we get the scale that we need uh, just through utilization? And I think you, uh, I think previous questions were in a similar tone. So. Uh, you know, I was quite surprised when you said one to five percent is uh, potentially utilization and uh, uh, carbon storage is still uh, 
the, the, the current, uh, you know, uh, method for um, achieving the targets. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you want to add, add to it, so the, the question is really about achieving the scale that we need just through utilization. I don't think I have anything specific to add. No. Um, the, I, I guess I do have one thing. <laughs> the reason why I said one to five to ten is because it depends on whose study you're reading. There are some and there are some boundary conditions you need to think about and the resources that kind of go into these things and and what's really possible. And so it, it ranges, but even in the best case scenarios, you know, it's not enough. Thank you. Um, okay, um, our next question uh, is is about the solutions that we discussed today on industry. Are the uh, the areas where they can impact the release? Sorry, where we can impact the release of carbon from individual consumers or individual customers? Um, I'm not entirely sure what what this question is asking so like a very small scale i gather you know yeah um, so household scale or distributed yeah distributed co2 conversion so I, I suppose the question is uh, probably is direct air capture a possible solution for distributed co2 uh, production like you know transport industry for example Or, or the, the solutions that we have discussed today is only applicable for point sources or can they be applied to distributed CO2 sources yeah. as well? I mean, I, I guess we could answer it that way. The other, the way I was reading it is what can individuals do or can there be an impact? But, in, but if we look at it from, um, yeah, I, I mean, that's how I read it. And I would just say that they're having knowledge of companies that are practicing these things. So for instance, you know, um, Unilever is one company that has an amazing, you know, pledge to look at a lot of reduced pathways for the supply chains that go into their materials. Um, as an individual, it's, you know, you can look at companies that are actually leading the way uh, to doing some of these things. But I don't know if, if the question is asking something different than that. It's hard to say. Yeah. Um, anyone would like to add to that? I think uh, I, I would like to add from uh, Woodside energy perspective and which is indicative of the energy industry. We have actually made deliberate efforts and technological uh, changes in terms of first reducing what we emit. And that is the first step. And I think Jennifer, you mentioned Unilever, many industries are going on that path. What can we do in order to reduce our CO2 footprint? our emissions and that is the first step uh, and just getting to that I, I i contend that having efficient process engineering will help us reduce at least five to seven percent of industrial co2 emissions mm -hmm. okay. and i'd also suggest even from the sort of individual point of view there's um again it's in about supporting programs where you know, reforestation, where it makes sense and where it's being done correctly and all that kind of thing, um, because that all helps us um, you know, sequester CO2 and often can be more effective for the, um, for the wide scale, uh, you know, way of uh, yeah, for distributed, distributed CO2. Thank you. Um, and our uh, last question uh, this uh, morning is, uh, Talking about the utilization versus capture, would uh, storage in uh, long life products be more viable than single use products? Uh, for example, replacing sand or gravel as concrete aggregate. So I guess, uh, Jennifer, you, you talked about the, uh, the concrete as a viable pathway. Some industries are already using that um, in, in US. So if you could uh, maybe elaborate a bit more on that. Sure. I mean, and one thing I think that's being missed, because I've seen this in a few of the questions, is this distinction between utilization versus capture versus storage. So all of these things have different meanings and they're connected um, and sometimes they overlap. And so it makes it confusing for me to understand what somebody really wants to know. Um, but, but just to make clear, um, 
Oftentimes for utilization, even with mineralization to a synthetic aggregate, back to the bacterial question or the algae, microalgae, the purity of the CO2 stream coming in is actually really important. If you have an alkalinity feedstock that's really reactive, like a mineral called brucite, where the magnesium is ready to react and the particle size is really small, so you have high surface area, uh, then that could be reactive with CO2 in the atmosphere, as is. You know, mm -hmm. and that's that's the case in some nickel mining or tailings um, from different mining industries. Um, but in other cases, you might actually have to mine alkalinity. Maybe it's olivine or serpentine or some of these other types of minerals that are rich in magnesium, but you need a more concentrated stream of CO2 and maybe even high pressure in order to get them to turn into a synthetic aggregate. So to me, it's like capture, separation, or purification of CO2. Those are all equivalent. And sometimes that needs to be coupled to the utilization aspect, to the conversion part of making a product. Uh, that's one thing. The other piece is that geologic storage is one way, but storage in a mineral is another way of storage. Even storage in a fuel, whether or not it's going to last a day or a month, is still a form of stir storage. It's just that the time scale of storage is what's distinct amongst all of these. So I think it's important that language, um, at least that we, we're all on the same page. And then in terms of um, the long life cycle products be more viable than single use products, uh, I, I am not sure what the, the anonymous attendee means by long lifestyle products, but, but what I would say is you could compare things like synthetic gravel and you do have to consider the life cycle. And so how long is the building lasting? You know, what's going to happen when, it, it, when the depo, demolition takes place and you have this mineral that's broken down? You increase the surface area. Some of that CO2 is probably, you know, not still captured, but it's really difficult from a mineral to get the CO2 to be re-emitted. In some cases, 600 to 900 degrees C of heat in order to calcine it again. Um, the other piece is in a plastic. If we could, you know, ban single-use plastic, that would be impactful. Uh, and, but in terms of CO2 in a, in a plastic is also, you know, an interesting um, storage um, option. So I'm kind of talking around this, but... but <laughs> that, that's a nice segue for me to, to, uh, to pass this question to Victoria, because one of the things that, uh, you know, in, in the hub application we've just submitted, we've kind of proposed a solution to, to take it from CO2 to, to plastics uh, as, as one viable alternative. So that is... Uh, potentially a uh, longer term than uh, CO2 to fuels because at the end of the day, you know, fuels uh, will emit that CO2 back into the atmosphere, but plastics, they have that CO2 in circulation in the solid form in the longer life. So maybe, Victoria, if you could elaborate a bit more on that. Mm. And I, I do hasten to say, so long as that, um, that plastic that it's going into doesn't now cause you another problem, you know, um, and that being a plastic pollution problem. So, but yes, we, we are thinking about bioplastics in terms of um, both a, a way to sequester them for some time, but they, these are compostable. So that they will ultimately be, um, you know, the CO2 will be ultimately either find its way into another organism or, or re-released to the, to the atmosphere. So, but that's, I mean, that is still a preferable um, route to go through. But yeah, I think, I, I think where the question is coming from is, do we put, do we think about the lifetime of that sequestered CO2 when we think about it, a choice between whether, which way we'll go, you know, do we think, oh, fuel's only going to last a short amount of time, a, a bioplastic might last longer, and, and therefore we should go the bioplastic. I think, I think the situation at the moment is still that, we should go forward with the sorts of things that have the right life cycle and have the right economics and are the right thing to do. And um, I think if you're, if it is a transport fuel and you can do this effectively, you are replacing what would be crude, crude source otherwise. So it's still a benefit. So, um, but it really has to be the, the thing that is right for the time and for the place and for the organism. Then would you like to add uh, one more? I think we, we are um, already a couple of minutes over time, but if you have a couple, uh, maybe a quick one to add to this. Oh, no, actually, uh, well said. I don't need to add more to what Jennifer and Victoria uh, alluded to. So thank you, Akshat. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks uh, um, to every all, all the panelists, in fact, uh, for their wonderful insight into this, uh, you know, um, really hard uh, problem to solve. Uh, but I think, um, you know, there are uh, 
already quite innovative solutions uh, coming through and i think there's uh, there's a lot more that can be done um so with that i think um, i'll just like to uh, close this webinar and uh, invite you to join us uh, for our next webinar uh, from the woodside monash energy partnership which is on the 9th of december um, you will uh, uh, see these uh, flyers come through hopefully through the social media as well as uh, emails uh, this webinar will be focused on the fourth pillar of uh, uh, the, the partnership, which is on energy leadership. Um, this uh, theme, um, or this seminar rather, will have uh, um, three speakers again. Um, uh, Peter Metcalf, uh, who is the general manager uh, from uh, Woodside Energy in the uh, climate engagement. And uh, Dr. Emma Eisbett, uh, Associate uh, Director of ANU's Grand Challenge uh, Zero Carbon Energy for Asia Pacific, and Rob Kelly, uh, who is the uh, program manager at Climate Works Australia. And the energy leadership uh, is, is a key pillar for the Woodside Monash Energy Partnership um, because it's, it has a crucial role in um, enabling the transition uh, of the energy uh, into the future uh, uh, green energy sources. So uh, with that, I um, close this session and thank you everyone for joining in this morning. And sorry, we went a couple of minutes over time, um, but I think we had a really good discussion. So thanks, everyone, and see you next, next time.